Hello, Space Junkies, and welcome to episode 141 of What a Piece of Junk, the Star Wars show here on the Fandom Podcast Network. I am your agreeable host, Scott Butman, complete with new microphone arm, as you can see. This isn't some error by the boom mic operator. No, it's supposed to be there to make me look quasi-official, like all of my mass communication professors would be proud of with my radio production classes way back last millennium in college. But you know who wasn't way back last millennium? That's right, my original podcast co-pilot, Mr. Derek Marsh. Derek, how's it going? It's going good. It's been a few weeks since I've been on because we've had a little bit of a short break just because... uh, it was Easter weekend, the, the last time you guys got a chance to quick record, and I was unavailable with uh, the weekend, and then just spring break for the little one, and then last weekend was WrestleMania 40, and we were all that's right watching that two-part nighter, and just, you know, it was crazy busy for the rest of it. So, But here we are, so we'll get to catch the Space Junkie listeners up to speed with three episodes today, but uh, really looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, and uh, our very own Dave Filcloney is also joining us after having spent some time as Dave Filcloney. We packed even more stuff into last weekend and went to South Carolina Comic Con with Mr. Miracle in costume as Dave Filcloney. Yes, yes, I had a a good time there despite some some health issues. Uh, My eye was bothering me the whole time. you, if you look back at the pictures that we have, my you you can tell my left eye is uh, getting a little puffy there. But um, but I had fun nonetheless. Got to take a picture with the voice of Obi Wan Kenobi, J A T Jat, James Arnold Taylor himself. That was very cool, and he did a cool uh, force pose with the two fingers and all that. It it was pretty awesome. And uh, Scott, you got an autograph there, uh, not Star Wars related, but still a big name. Tell us about that. I- Absolutely. Um, I finally pulled the trigger on getting one of my Star Trek CCG cards signed by one William Shatner, the original Captain Kirk himself. It was great to meet William Shatner for just a couple of seconds as I stood there and said, thank you, Captain. And he said, thank you. And then he said, "Okay, this is ready for you to take it now, Uh, because as some of you know, Bill is 93 years old now, and so he was uh, not having the easiest of time with manual dexterity autographing everything, and then certainly he didn't have the manual dexterity to pick up items to hand them back to the attendees. So whether you had a book or a photograph or a poster, he would sign it, and then he would say, okay, this is ready for you, so that you could pick up the item. Um, Now, maybe it was just because he was tired. Maybe he didn't want to damage them or he was worried about something like that. But it very much looked like he wouldn't be able to, you know, grip everything uh, with his hands like that. Um, So I was glad that I went ahead and and got his signature. I've had this was the fourth chance I've had to get something signed by Bill. Um, The other three times I kept telling myself, "Ah, I don't know if I want to spend that much money. But every time the price would go up the next time. So I'm like, I'm just going to go ahead and do it because he's not going to be here forever. You know, so I was pleased don't regret it at all, and I can't wait to hang it on my wall and occasionally put it into a deck of Star Trek CCG 2nd Edition to put it out on the table and have my opponents and fellow players ooh and ah. Very cool. Uh, yeah, so SC Comic Con was great in general. Plenty of awesome Star Wars cosplay in addition to Nathan's Dave Filoni uh, get-up. We saw tons of clone troopers, a really great Captain Rex Uh, Several really good Ahsokas. Uh, And then there was a guy doing the um, big cybernetic-looking General Grievous cosplay where you, like, put your feet behind his cape and it makes it look like the mechanical feet are the ones actually moving as you walk. And he was huge! He was so tall. Um, So, yeah, it was really cool to get a picture with him. Uh, And then there were people there that had cosplays of the Night Troopers and Captain Enoch from the Ahsoka live-action series already done up with the gold and the red bandages and everything on their armor, and they just looked amazing. I don't know how people had the time to do that already. Captain Enoch even had the robotic voice, uh, which Mm -hmm. was neat to hear. And I had uh, someone dressed as the armorer, a a beautiful armorer costume, uh, run up and give me a hug and said, Master Dave (laughs) Filoni! Yeah, it was awesome. So... Can you tell us yet, uh, Nathan, what the, the whole thing was? Or did you have to sign an NDA and have to wait on it? No, no. It, it was just that they were there and, and okay. all in costume. Um, and, and they, and they, had, the, they had the selfie thingy, Maboop. They, they did have a, a selfie station. 
uh, where you could uh, go stand with one of the 501st. And I stood with uh, somebody dressed as Ezra Bridger. Cool. Um, the the older version, the the uh, Jedi version from Ahsoka, uh, nice. and uh, got a picture of that, uh, which Did... I, I posted on Facebook, so you mm-hmm. may have seen that. Mm-hmm. Oh, and it was, like was this little curious. it was this little stand where like mm-hmm. you and the person would sit and would stand in front of a um a backdrop, but then you put your phone into the holder yep. and it would like do little special effect looking stuff. Yeah, yeah. cool. So it was all fun, all cool. Yep. So excellent. So so did did they ask you to join the membership since it was easy enough for you? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, they did not ask me to go into membership. <laughs> Although I do still want to, uh, my sewing skills are just not up to snuff here. I do still want to get a Rebel Pilot outfit and be Trapper Wolf. There is a light side version of the 501st, um, the uh, Blue Ridge Base here in North Carolina, um, that I'd be able to apply to. Um, so hopefully at some point, knock, knock, I can get that done. But uh, it's. Um, not the bucket thing to do. Yeah, it's it's on the bucket list. Very cool. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it it's it's a part of the Rebel Legion, right? I think. Yes, that is correct. Yeah. Very cool. All right. So, speaking of light side stuff, I'll activate the light side special effects behind me there. So, I have too much fun with all these lights here at Domicile. <laughs> well, what um, you have? Yeah. Start- so. Oh, I was just gonna say what you have to start doing though is is when you turn it to the light side, it's gonna have to start playing the sunset of Tatooine, right? When from a new <laughs> hole. And then when it's red side, you have to play the Imperial March. So Yes, yes. I'll have to get a way to incorporate those without having a copyright strike. <laughs> you, you, get pl- you get plenty of stuff if it's within I think twenty or thirty seconds or something like that. Uh, I think it's fifteen. Yeah. But that's okay. okay. It wouldn't take more than five seconds. Yeah, pe- people will yeah. definitely get the idea. Well, anyway, we are here to talk about Star Wars, and specifically Star Wars The Bad Batch. Uh, Since we last recorded, there have been three episodes of The Bad Batch, and uh, not to be too much of a Debbie Downer, but the three of us kind of agree that they weren't super groundbreaking, earth-shattering episodes, so we're going to dig into them, but not as deep as we might would have if they were ones that we were more enamored of. Uh, So we're basically going to do the five questions, but we're going to cover all three of the episodes that have been on. So we'll be talking about Identity Crisis, Point of No Return, and Juggernaut. Juggernaut. No, this is... This is not an X-Men podcast all of a sudden, although, man, do we have thoughts and feelings about yes, X-Men 97. Anyway, but no, not that Remember kind of not. Well, long Remember story it. short, That's right. it's good. Go watch it. Yeah, go watch <laughs> X-Men 97. It's amazeballs. All right, so let's jump right in with the five questions, guys. What did you like best about these episodes? Again, this is episode 10, 11, and 12. So Identity Crisis, Point of No Return, and Juggernaut. Uh, Derek, what do you got? For your favorite so, part yeah i'll keep it quick um i'll give kind of like two for these answers for these next two parts because like you said we're kind of talking three episodes uh this one covers the first two 10 and 11 uh batcher uh you know to me he was great um there was a fun article i posted in the facebook chat uh group a couple of weeks ago when it came out uh the best thing about the the episodes 10 11 aren't omega it's batcher (laughs) and i had i had to concur with it it was just really good he was the most loyal he was actually the one who was actually doing something right like he actually his his um actions were actually having an impact on the team um for those first two episodes um and it's just it's just fun to see what he's you know what they have him do kind of as a background character um and obviously you know he's been very you know influential and and since he's been introduced to us earlier this season so um, I will probably remember season three as the season of Batcher. Um, yeah. But uh, the other other thing that I was going to say was um, the first two thirds of this episode thir- 12, Jungger- Juggernaut, was just fun again. It was, you know, with them doing the whole initial heist of uh, Rampart. And it was just really good. It was, again, what we fell in love with, with, you know, when Bad Batch was introduced in season seven of the Clone Wars and really what season one had started off at what it felt like, um, you know, again, they were telling an overarching story, but it really felt like, yeah, we're just going to get these 
mercenary Bad Batch clone guys going on random adventures. And, you know, it's going to be fun. There's going to be a lot of action, silly stuff, all that. Um, and that was good. And, you know, and the and the positive with it is that I could actually watch this episode because it was bright. It wasn't in the Yay! dark. So that's going into question, too. So I'll still refrain from anything else there. But, yes, no, I really liked um, the first part of this episode um, with them having to go off Rampart and, and rescue him. Um, and just, just the interaction between him and the clones was, was fun too. But like I said, that was what I fell in love with, with Bad Batch. And it was nice to get that, um, every once in a while, as we've alluded to with, you know, the best scenes for most of these season two and season three seem to be when the Bad Batch aren't involved <laughs> or <laughs> around some other characters. So it was nice <laughs> to actually have it be around the Bad Batch. Yeah, totally. Uh, all right, Nathan, what did you like best about these three episodes? Uh, well, I'll go with uh, two things as well, but um, in the idea of stealing ideas from Derek, uh, one of them is going to be the same thing as his. So my first <laughs> one is Cad Bane. Uh, I love seeing him, uh, and he got to be just as villainous and mustache twirling as he's ever been. He's stealing kids for Palpatine again. Uh, that's something that he's known to do. The candy so. man. Yeah, uh, right up his alley he has no problem with doing stuff like that um, he is very much a villain not just a simple man making his way through the galaxy uh, so it was neat to see that um, as kind of a continuation of his character from the Clone Wars uh, and then the second thing was uh, in the episode Juggernaut getting to see the Bad Batch actually take on a mission and go do a mission you know the thing that we thought they'd be doing all throughout their series that they haven't done nearly as much of as we thought they would be you know it's the thing that made us fall in love with them in the clone wars when we had that extra season of the clone wars they went and did missions and that's what we loved about them i want to see more of that i've got some problems with that episode and we'll talk about that in a little bit but yeah the start of that episode where they're going off to do a mission was very good i like that Cool, cool. I, I'm inclined to agree with you guys that uh, doing the mission in the Juggernaut episode was really good. Although uh, I won't list it as one of my favorite parts because you guys have well covered that. Uh, one of my favorite parts was seeing Crosshair fail to get the homing beacon shot against the uh, Imperial dropship um, when we have the end of uh, episode uh, 12. 11. No, sorry, 11. Uh, where uh, the, the Clone X and them have captured Omega, and basically before she surrendered herself, she was all, I'm not worried about it, Crosshair. You're going to be able to shoot the homing beacon onto the ship and come rescue me. I know you've got this. And it was nice to see our heroes really, really fail. Like, Crosshair failed not just to do the thing. He failed to do the thing that he's famous for doing right? It's like if, if anybody was laying odds on, will Crosshair make that shot so that they can go save Omega? You would have been tempted to be like, oh yeah, there's like a 90% chance he's going to make that shot, but he missed it. And I like it's emphasizing that Crosshair has had character development and, and changing over the course of season three, and really the course of season two and three, um, where he now is not Mr. I can shoot in my way out of anything and fire bullets around corners and whatnot. Um, I mean, he still does that stuff to a certain degree during the fight on Pabu in this episode, uh, Point of No Return, but... Um, but when it comes right down to it, for the final moment, he fails. But that leads into my second favorite part, because we're kind of doing two each here. I loved that Admiral Rampart was back, and we had, I will just say it, an homage to Rogue One, where we go and rescue Jin Erso from the back of a turbo tank, where <laughs> she's being hauled around on a Imperial work planet site as a prisoner. Uh, but in this case, it's the Bad Batch coming to rescue Rampart instead of K2 coming, K2SO coming to rescue Jin Erso. But almost the exact same thing happens. Uh, and you could get a little grumpy and say, well, isn't that kind of lazy storytelling? But to me, this was homage to Rogue One. Uh, because as much as we don't like to think about it, Rogue One's been a few years ago now, so it's to the point where we can start making cool references to it as opposed to it being a current part of the Star Wars pantheon. Actually, uh, I felt like it was more Mad Max just because they were like going through with the two machines and then having to go well, and that's, break into the thing. And that's true. Prison. Definitely 
definitely when they have the duel of the tanks, it felt like Mad Max, for sure. Um, but when they were breaking into the thing and walking down the hallway in the in the cargo bay of the turbo tank, it looked like the beginning of Rogue One. Especially when uh, Rampart was kind of all like, "Why are you here? Are are you gonna kill me? Or are you what what's happening?" It kind of felt like you being rescued. You know, do not resist. <laughs> do not resist. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Totally. All right. Well, speaking of you can be grumpy, let's uh, move into question two, and that is, uh, what did you like the least about these episodes? Uh, Nathan, we will start with you because I think you have a few things to say. Uh, well, I'm I'm going to go with just one big one, and it is with the episode Juggernaut. Okay, so we've taken over the uh, the Juggernaut itself, the the titular Juggernaut, and we have Rampart, and then we stop and let all the rest of the prisoners off, which lets the base know that you know your juggernaut has been compromised and, and then what do we need to do from here now normally i'm the type of person that if the characters make a suboptimal decision that's not a plot hole you know that's something that characters can do but there was absolutely no reason to continue on to the base like at this point you have control of the juggernaut all you need to do is leave Turn around. <laughs> exactly. Like the rest of the episode was completely nonsensical. Especially once they got to the bridge and they're closing up the bridge. At that point, there's no way that you think, ah yes, we can sneak back on because they don't know that we're the enemy. Turn around. Go away. <laughs> Signal to fee. Have her pick you up well away from the guns and go but now was it didn't they have an offhand line about the base is jamming us so we can't call fee i thought the whole point was they had to go bust up some kind of transmitter so then they could call fee but couldn't they just literally just drive back and be out of the range at some point like yeah, does, does it literally I, cover I the know. whole planet at that point like i would have gotten to understand like if it would have been like rogue one where it's like, oh, we have to get through an energy field and we have to sneak back off the planet, right? right I could see right. that to, to you know, yeah. the point where, you, like, to Nathan's, like, there would have been something there, which very well could have been, right? But they had to chop it off to make it, you know, a 22 minute episode, but who knows? All right, right. I'm going to go dig into the Wikipedia while Nathan continues his uh, answer here. Um, they did talk about having their comms jammed, but it seemed like the Imperials were surprised that their comms were jammed. Um, so I'm I'm not sure what was going on. I I spent the latter half of that episode trying to figure out why the mission's going the way it is, and that that's not good. <laughs> to be fair, Nathan watched it this morning, and he could have that's been true. very tired when he woke that, up. That is true. Maybe I missed something obvious. Um, <laughs> maybe I don't know. But in that case, my answer is there was something. Still. <laughs> that if you missed it, the whole thing made no sense. Yeah, yeah. Like, uh, the, 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 turn around. Also, I'm sorry, those other prisoners are doomed. Yeah, they are. Like, like, we just let you off on the middle of this Imperial planet. Now the Imperials think that you have tried to escape. And you are not getting off that planet if you are the other <laughs> No joke. It's it, like, the one guy's like, I had one more week before parole. And that's <laughs> exactly. Yeah, if I, if I were one of the other prisoners, I'd be like, look, you're either taking me with you or I, they are going to find me on this juggernaut going, I'm sorry, I didn't run. <laughs> like one or the yeah. other. I, can, I am I not mean, getting out. Also, also kind of a reference to Andor, the series, and the, the man, because, you know, when they escape from the prison planet with Kino Loy, uh, indeed, several of the other prisoners are just doomed, because mm -hmm. there's nowhere to go. There's one way out, but then there's nowhere or to go. Or they can't so. swim. Like our or man, they can't swim. And, you yeah. know. Yeah, like Kino Loy cannot swim. Yeah. Yep. You know, did our man dirty there, so. I'm still hope yep. holding out, though, that he did it somehow find an escape. Like, he just jumped down there and just, like, grabbed someone's dead body and just floated off until he got to... You know. Yeah, you don't need to swim. Yeah. You just need to float long enough. <laughs> yep, yep. 
Yeah. All right, I, I, I'm done with my little rant. So um. yeah, I have. I cannot find any one particular point of detail about uh, the episode Juggernaut on Wikipedia's summary about why they had to go back across the base. So uh, yeah, I'll just have to watch it again, and then if I care enough, I'll mention it next episode of the podcast. Hey, so um, anyway. those, uh, those those uh, subtitles, right? So yes, or the or the. Um, Image description, or sorry, what is it called? The assi- description assistance, or whatever it is, where you can listen to it tell you what things look like uh, for the vision uh, vision impaired folks, which is actually kind of fun because, like I said last audio episode of the podcast, that's it, uh, descriptive audio, um, where you occasionally get the Ted Knight, meanwhile, at Pabu. So, you know. <laughs> anyway, uh, Derek, uh, what did you like least about these episodes? So I have two things, but I want to give a general statement again, and I'm kind of mocking it earlier in my question one. So again, I am really, really getting upset and peeved off with the darkness in these episodes. Um, and just, you know, as other people have even stated in comments when they make comments about these things, like when they post Facebook, like we haven't watched the episode and either, you know, Facebook, whether it's bots or actual people that respond to stuff. But when people mm-hmm. actually respond with this, I'm like, well, they actually watched it. Then because that's pretty darn descriptive. That it's like, it's so dark, I can't see this. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. my I'm, old my old man eyes hate it as well. And and I I'm just trying to think back, like guys, like even in the, the episodes that had like darkness or night in Clone Wars or Rebels, it was never this bad, right? Okay, I, I right. don't remember. No. Never being. For, for the listeners that uh, you can't see, they were shaking their heads now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, it was not that bad. <laughs> so and so, it's like at this point now, I'm just like, okay, if like the next animation we get of Star Wars is this bad, like I'm just not gonna watch it anymore. It's it's upset me that much. It's like, good golly, like how am I supposed to do anything to appreciate this and watch what you're trying to do and put people through to make you know pay people to make and do? It's like, come on. It's just getting really, 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 and I get it that they're, you know, it's on Disney Plus and they're not, you know, getting quote unquote reimbursement or whatever, however they look at for commercials and stuff. But anyways, tiny, tiny rant there that, you know, it's it's really getting me upset because I couldn't enjoy episode 10 and 11 because of that. So, all right. So my two issues or things I disliked about these three epos. The first one is um, apparently it's just not the Bad Batch that are full of idiots. So Fee... Uh, with how the um, uh, assassin um, clone basically goes onto her ship, and yet she has an alarm. Don't get me wrong. Hey, she at least has an alarm. But you have an Mm -hmm. alarm that you literally walk into one door in the next cell over, and you can't hear your alarm go off? Like, what is the point of having an alarm if it doesn't even notify you when you're not in the (laughs) ship? Yeah, like at least have it ping your comm link or your wrist computer or something. Or the droid you went with, you know what I'm saying? Like something. Yeah. something. Security in the Star Wars universe <laughs> is not tight. And so no. I'm just sitting there like, I thought she was supposed to be the smarter of the of the you know the crew, but apparently not because we have to have plot armor for them to figure out how to go to Padu because you know magically you know and then she's you know whatever. So that was terrible yet again. Um, and the stupidity, and it just seems to be a recurring theme where it's now it's an inside joke, I feel like, that they're just purposely doing it within this season. Um, and then the other thing I had was um, something different from the last episode of Juggernaut than what Nathan was describing. Mine is that friggin' Omega is captured and we're back at Mount Tantus. So literally, we spent episode 2 through 12 at this point to end back up right where we were at. And I just felt like totally just a waste of my time. It's literally to the point of like, we, we get out of this just so we can do some hoopla reuniting. I mean, I get it to some degree where they wanted to work on the character of Crosshairs and you wouldn't have been able to have this. But at the end of the day, you, you could have done something different, I feel like, and just kept Omega on Tantus. Like Crosshairs was trying to do something and he had to. And he this would have really shown him trying to like work his... Um, favor back with Hunter and try to get back without having to have Omega vouch for him and stuff like that. So they could have gone that route, and that would have been to me a lot better than the whole point of yay, we rescued Omega, and then we keep putting her in danger, and you know, we finally don't put her in danger, but we're stupid and leave our car doors open. 
Um, and <laughs> we basically just have her. And all those poor innocent people, innocent people. Now, granted, it's ironic that they were just planning to leave. And, you know, then the Empire comes in and, and, and knocks them out. Right. And it's like, OK. And then and we still haven't heard anything um, about the um, uh, previous clones. Right. And like how what their side of the story is of after letting Bad Batch go um, after the last incident. So, you know, it's like, well, we're, why weren't they just magically there to, you know, help save the day or something? Again, just it felt really, really stupid that we've wasted 12 episodes on this. And like I said, that's where I'm just upset about this season because season one, I enjoyed season two. You know, we had our issues with it, but we were really excited when they brought Mount Tantus in. And we've yeah. literally just wasted two thirds of the season of just running around in a circle and not really doing anything with with the story. Yeah, I'm a bit inclined to agree with everything you guys have just said, but I have only one major complaint about these three episodes. What the heck, Lucasfilm? The Millennium Falcon is an iconic starship because you let it go on lots of cool adventures and we all got to fall in love with it over the course of several different stories. If you keep blowing up the spaceships, you can't then turn around and ask us why toy sales are down. You destroyed the Marauder almost as unceremoniously as you destroyed the Razor Crist. And I am pissed at you for this, because I liked the Marauder. And I liked the Razor Crest, but that was a whole different series. But there was no reason for you to blow up the Marauder. You could have just had the clone disable it. Now, granted, I am very grateful that you took a moment so that Wrecker could save Gonki. That was great. But how can we have iconic starships if you keep exploderizing them? And then you let us keep the ones that don't have the cool iconic names and backstories that are just almost generic. I don't understand where you're going with this thought process, guys. Like at Lucasfilm, you can't have another Millennium Falcon if you don't give ships names because we've had so many ships in The Mandalorian that look cool, but they don't have names. They barely even have call signs. I mean, yes, we have the ghost, but that's been a number of years ago now. And I'm really worried that the next time we see the ghost, it's going to get blown to smithereens. Although I do have some assurance that it has to make it to the sequel trilogy. Because didn't we see that in um, The Rise of Skywalker? Uh, yeah. yeah, I believe it was one of the yeah. ships. But either way, you, you, didn't have, a lot like it. you didn't have to blow up the Marauder. That's all I'm saying. That's my major complaint about this three episodes is we had the CX clone come and blow up the Marauder unceremoniously while Wrecker and Gonky were hanging around. Well, you see, Scott, we want to sell you more toys by making well, that's sure it. you have to get a new ship every few episodes. Yeah, but the, but then they don't because they replaced the Razor Crest with that N1, but I had to just call it that N1. It doesn't even have a name, and you can find it for sale in some limited editions, but you... You, I still see Razor Crest merchandise on the store shelves. I saw an ERTL brand uh, model kit for the Razor Crest at Hobby Lobby just last week. Great looking kit. I might would have bought it if I still had any more display space, but that's a rant for a different time about something completely unrelated to Star Wars. Um, but uh, more so, um, I don't ever see anything really selling the Mandalorian's new starship because we don't know what it's called. How can you market it if you're just like the Mandalorian's ship? I mean, yes, it's technically that is the N1 correct description. But... Their name. <laughs> yeah, I know, and it's just that it's like, you know, and here's Bob's Ford F-150. No, you need to give the thing a name. I don't well, that's understand. That's what they did with Boba Fett's starship, the fire spray. Like, the very one that away the name. Right now. <laughs> yes, they, they took away the Slave One name and they just called it the Fire Spray. Although, didn't they actually like rewrite the entire um, mythos about this? The, the Fire Spray is now its name, not the model name. And like, it, it doesn't have a model name anymore. Uh, no, I think did? it is the model name, but he also just calls it the Fire Spray. Okay. Yeah, because apparently Slave One is so offensive in today's terms. So. Which, I mean, I, I, I get not wanting to call it Slave One, but. Uh, At the very least, give it a different name. name. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Don't just name it after the. Yeah, this is my this is my Chevy Bolt. No, it's, it's the Stormtrooper. It's the Grey Ghost. Call it something. But it's not like they don't have like in the stories that they're doing because I I get it. They want to make Star Wars for everyone. But again, when you literally have a thing called Star Wars, that's probably not to be honest something you should target for kids, anyways. But yes, here we are, forty some years later, right? But yeah, it's just it's but I totally agree with you, Scott. Great point. It's like, yeah, come on. We can't get iconic stuff. 
because like like you said yeah okay you know we're just gonna get memes of people just making jokes of you know rubble of a pile of legos is is you know the new version of the razor crest yeah so yeah now it it, it comes pre-assembled you know (laughs) as a pile of junk open the bag fresh fresh bag of mint so yeah anyway okay so that was my rant about what i disliked about the episodes let's Move on to question number three, uh, and I'll start. I will not start by saying, oh, it's connected to the destruction of the Razor Crest. Ha, ha, ha. Um, but no, what connections did you draw to the rest of the Star Wars galaxy? Well, I've already talked about all the Andor homage and reference stuff, um, but we also had um, Clone Wars references because we got to see the, a juggernaut, a, a turbo tank, right? Two turbo tanks. They faced off against each other. Pretty cool battle. Uh, and then... Uh, a deeper cut to the Clone Wars, we got to see Crosshair tell Wrecker to do plan number blah, blah, blah. And Wrecker got to be all like, uh, oh, yeah, got it. I'm waiting on you. So plan 55 in full effect. And uh, I loved the callback to the times when the Bad Batch would go on missions and have a pre-made stratagem that they were all they had always practiced and whatnot. So, yeah, that was pretty cool. Uh, Nathan, what did you draw as connections to the rest of the Star Wars galaxy? Well, I've already talked a little bit about Cad Bane and how he has, uh, in the past, stolen children for uh, Darth Sidious slash Palpatine. Uh, but a vehicle, uh, in addition to the Juggernauts, the Turbo Tanks, we also got to see the LAATs, uh, which are the flying, uh, the open side uh, transport uh, ships that the Empire was using. Um, these. Actually, you know what? I said LAAT. Those aren't actually LAATs. They're the same uh, type of ship that we saw in the um, Attack of the Clones yeah. uh, movie with the open sides. I apologize. The LAAT is a slightly different ship. I, I apologize for, so- con- for confusing my uh, Republic slash Imperial <laughs> um, transport ships that operate in atmosphere and can open their sides. Curse yeah. you. It's the a, one that Padme fell out of. A bit similar. Yes, this is the one that Padme <laughs> fell out of. Not the one that Tarkin used in Rebels. Um, right. Which that one has did, the almost TIE fighter looking windshield. The one that Tarkin it, yes, used in Rebels. Yes, uh, which, which did also get used in the Clone Wars, uh, but as more of a patrol craft on Coruscant. Uh, but it, it was neat to see uh, some ships that we had seen in the movies. Uh, and, and we also got to see Tarkin. Uh, Tarkin was kind of chewing out um, Hemlock about uh, wasting funds because he wants to divert funds to the Death Star. We don't hear that term in this uh, episode, but um, we know from uh, various Tarkin books that, uh, excuse me, um, Thrawn books, that Tarkin is kind of shoveling money towards the Death Star. Um, And that's what he's doing here and why he's upset that this project is taking up these funds and not going to something the Emperor really cares about. I enjoyed how quickly Tarkin shifted from perhaps I can help you to you better not screw this up whenever Mm -hmm. uh, Hemlock was essentially telling him, no thanks, I don't need your help, you know. So it was very much petty squabbles, territorial nonsense, my fiefdom. Very much. And and we know Tarkin's going to come out ahead on this one because, well, we don't hear about Hemlock in A New Hope. (laughs) And we do hear about Tarkin. But we do have him come up in episode nine, right? So uh, we we definitely have some of the fruits of the labor from what they're doing now. But uh, I, I think Himlock himself is uh, doomed. I don't know. Doomed. They can still have Pal come back again because this will be the clone of Pal. <laughs> yes, P A A A A A L P A T I N E. All right, well, <laughs> I, I've, hit, I've hit all the connections that I've got for this, so uh, let's move okay. on. All right, Derek, what you got for connections to the rest of the Star Wars galaxy? Well, the first two, it's so hard to see what's going on because it's so dark, so I really couldn't come up with connections there. But um, it caught my it caught my ear a little bit in, in episode 12, Juggernaut, um, with the two stormtroopers. Um, that are outside um, of the prison, and uh, they uh, at the first portion that the uh, uh, Bad Batch take out, and uh, I was like, oh, that voice definitely is recognizable. So that was like the one thing that I waited for at the end, and actually paused the credits so I could read it, and it was the great Steve Bloom, 
which obviously you guys should know is the voice of many characters on Star Wars, but most, which is Zeb Arellis. Um, so there's my connection. So nice. Very nice. I always love, yeah. I always love a good Star Wars Rebels connection. Uh, to me, that I know that Nathan loves the Clone Wars as a animated series, and it's really good. Uh, but to me, Rebels is my favorite animated Star Wars. So that's cool. Uh, to I always like. see the connection. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, cool, cool. All right. Well, I we bet do you weren't going to say Bad Batch. <laughs> I was yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. It's it's. No. I, I you know it's above resistance. <laughs> True. True. But I'm not Although sure I if know. It's a... Go ahead, Scott. I know that there are fans of Resistance out there. So to those of you who liked Resistance, and that was that was your Star Wars cartoon you grew up with, rock and roll. Because also, I would not be saying Star Wars Ewoks are Star Wars droids. Yeah. Yeah. But I was also going to say, but I might put Bad Batch below Young Jedi, so. <laughs> the Adventures of the Young Jedi. Mm. Oh, ooh. No. Well, that's a, de- that's a debate well, for another that, time. I, I think that's not even really a question, uh, because that the target audience is so different. Yeah, but at least I'm having more fun. <laughs> you know, I don't have kids, so, you know, maybe you are having more fun with that. Uh, I'll, sometimes I'll I watch it when Sophia's just playing off anyway, not paying attention, so I'll just flip it <laughs> yes. on. So. I, I saw somebody on threads talking about that stuff happening with children's television, that you as a parent sit down to watch it with your kid, and over the course of the season, you get way more invested in it than the kid ever cares about. And his example was not Star Wars related, but it was funny. He was like, I can tell I've been watching too much Bluey with my yes, child, Bluey. because the family is getting ready on Bluey to think about selling their house, and I am yes. way too nervous about about them selling their house. <laughs> that just aired over this past weekend. It was like the big thing that came out. So, yeah, yeah. so we watched it this morning. <laughs> yeah, I, I have heard about Bluey possibly selling his house, and I don't even have kids. <laughs> yeah, me, my so, kids are adults, so, you know, deal. I'm like... I will tell you guys, though, Bluey, Bluey is designed, it is actually, it is a family show. So yeah. it is something that you guys could actually watch, and it's not like Young Jedi, it's not like the uh, amazing Spider-Man and his friend type deal thing, you know, it's obviously not quite X-Men 97, um, but it would, it's, it's very clever. There's very, there's a lot of not dirty, but clever adult humor in that you'll, that okay. You find. All right. All right. Well, I will say for Spider-Man and his amazing friends, at least the one in the 1980s, Firestar made sure that I kept watching that show for a long time. Since <laughs> yeah, I was but well I think Tarek was talking about the uh, the kind of chibi one where yeah, the, the, the new new animation one. Yeah. Then then and... very much ignore what I just said. <laughs> well, I appreciate they're both on Disney Plus, so. <laughs> oh, that's true. That's true. All right, well, we do have question four and five, customized questions about this triple set of episodes uh, that we will come back right back to. But first, we're going to take a quick break so Kevin can tell us about the rest of the Fandom Podcast Network. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show, our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU podcast, discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. 
Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. All right, thanks very much, Kevin. Please check out the rest of those shows, everybody. Okay, let's take it away with question four and five. So uh, who's got question number four? I'd be there. I do. All, All right. right. So my question is, um, do we think Rex will join the Bad Batch for Mount Tantus? Yeah, I think it's almost a foregone conclusion at this point that Rex and probably several of the other surviving clone troopers who have joined the light side, if you will, um, will show up to help in some big series finale of a battle. Uh, let's get the light side action happening here. Yay, good guys. Okay, and I think that Rex is going to help lead the charge in a certain section of the base. I do think that the Bad Batch when they come with all their friends to rescue Omega and the other kids that have been kidnapped in Mount Tantus, uh, the ones that we've seen, like Jax and them, and then maybe there's some others that we haven't seen, or maybe there are in those containers that uh, Derek was talking about a few episodes of the podcast ago, uh, when we saw Palpatine take the tour of Mount Tantus and there was big, like, red and black zone of stuff that are stored away there in the vault behind the laser gates uh, at Mount Tantus, I think that uh, the Bad Batch and their clone brothers are going to just wreck shop, and they're going to destroy everything, almost, at Mount Tantus, uh, which is part of the reason why, even in The Mandalorian and beyond, they're still working on Project Necromancer. Um, because if, if Hemlock is so close, like we see him right now in Season 3 of The Bad Batch, He's got Omega, he's got the M-Count transfer thing ready, he's been able to successfully do lots of clone bodies, they just don't have the force powers that Palpatine really wants, etc., etc. Um, why would it take him, like, 30 more years, 40 more years to, to pull it off to the point where Palpatine has a new body? Um, it doesn't, you know, like, I understand that it takes a while to implement new projects or whatever, but decades and upon decades, when you're this close, I think that Dr. Carr, or maybe even Omega and the Bad Batch themselves, are going to blow enough stuff up and perhaps, as Derek said, kill Dr. Hemlock, um, or sorry, as Nathan said, kill Dr. Hemlock, um, <clears throat> that we will get to the point where they lose all that progress they made on Project Necromancer. They have, like, just one thumb drive that survives or whatever. Because as we know, there's no such thing as the internet or storing documents in the cloud in the Star Wars galaxy. So if the data crystal or the book itself gets blown up, you lose it, right? For some reason, we don't believe in doors that lock on our spaceships, and we don't believe in backup copies of data tapes. Uh, um, so if you, and handrails. Yeah. I noticed and, and, and we don't believe in handrails. <laughs> we have no OSHA. It's, you can truly tell that it's a fascist evil empire because they're like, workers' rights? What the are you talking about? Anyway, um, that's a whole different Well, maybe problem. that's why they're uh, against the clones, because the clones unionized. Yes, yes, absolutely, that's why. That was the whole thing with Rampart and the clones' rights. Anyway, um, but yeah, I think that um, that Rex is coming, and he's bringing the house with him. In fact, they might be the cavalry that arrives in the titular The Cavalry Arrives for the final episode of Season 3 of The Bad Batch. Uh, Nathan, what do you think? Uh, to put it succinctly, yes. <laughs> Boom, that, that's, excellent. That's the whole answer. Yeah. <laughs> no notes. <laughs> No notes. Okay, uh, Derek, what's your answer to your own question? Uh, I think he will, but I don't. Th I think they'll be the cavalry, right? I think it'll be <laughs> the Bad Batch. You know, <clears throat> Squad Ninety Nine will go down, and they'll go ahead and try to rescue Omega, right? And they'll get her, and they're just <clears throat> about to get out, and then Hamlock will corner them or whatever, and then, like you said, then here comes Rex. Da -da 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 -da. Um, and that, and or maybe Rex might go with them, and then um, uh, uh, now I'm drawing a blank. Who is the other clone? Uh, Commander uh, Cody. Uh, Cody. Wolf. Cody. Wolf. Wolf. Right. Wolf. Yeah, Wolf. Will come uh, in. Are you talking about one that survives into Rebels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, the one then, that they. Then it's Gregor and Wolf. Yeah. So, well, no, uh, no, it'd be it'd be Cody then, right? Cody, we do not know where he is as of rebels so okay. he, he could be deceased all right but okay now since who was who who basically plot armored themselves out and helped them five episodes ago who was the one clone that helped them escape 
Oh, that that is Wolf, right? That, that is Wolf. Wolf. Okay. Oh, that's yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Yes. Yes. Sorry. That's yeah. good. That's sorry. Right. I didn't confuse at that when you said it the, the way you did. Sorry. So. And, and oh. he is one of the three that's on the Correct. planet. Uh, so it could be could be Rex goes with them initially, and then Wolf is the cavalry. But somebody will come save them at the end. Um, either it'll be uh, Rex with Wolf. Um, or it'll be Rex goes with them and then Wolf will come save them, turn the tide at the end. So, um, but it would be interesting. It kind of sucks that they're going to end the Mount Tantis thing with this series um, because I felt like they could have done a lot more with it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, hey, I could be, I could be wrong. They might not go to Mount Tantis and Rex shop. They, this could, it could end a whole different way. They, I still think they're going to save Omega and I still think Rex is going to help, but Maybe Omega and the kids stage some sort of escape, but then they're, you know, trapped by the Empire somewhere else. Or we have a nice big space battle as they chase Omega's shuttle and all them. And that's when the cavalry arrives to save the shuttle and they all escape. Um, and But then, again, Captain Rex and all the other clones are there. With, you know, Fireball and the crew show up to help save the shuttle. They use the leech vessel again to, you know, get the kids off the shuttle and fly back to the Republic cruiser just as the Empire blows up the shuttle so on and so forth. Maybe. So yeah, but we yeah. could still have we could have Mount Tantus um, be a thing in Dave Filoni's uh, movie with the Mando and Grogu. I mean, I I would hope that they would have done more with it, but but even then, at the movie side, it just doesn't sound that it would be again taking full advantage of it because it's just a movie. Then, like again, I really wish they would have done a whole lot more with it and what they could have done, but again. We're you know taking bits and pieces of legend and plopping them in. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know we could have some stuff for the next season of Ahsoka live action show happen over at Mount Tantus, I or mean, maybe you know, the Asajj like, spinoff. Yeah, Thr- Thrawn probably knows where Mount Tantus is, so now that oh, he's sure, back yeah. in the main galaxy, he's gonna be like, "Don't worry, everyone. My plan all along has been to go to Mount Tantus and get all these secret weapons," which is exactly what happened in *Heir to the Empire*. So if we're getting all the pieces and putting them back together from the old novel, we gotta have Thrawn go to Mount Tantus, bust open the vault, and be like, "Check out all this cool stuff that I know how to do." So maybe you pull out some, uh, you know. Uh, uh, you know, frozen Jedi kids mm-hmm. that were t- half turned to cyborg, you know, death trooper or yeah, death trooper or no, dark yep. troopers. Uh, yeah, so. he's got death troopers already, but but he yeah, could have dark, troopers. dark trooper mark two. Um, he could get that mass driver thing. Uh, he could be all look at all of these extra tide defenders that I squirreled away at Mount Tentis. We've got a whole squadron of them. Doo-doo-doo. Well, I you still know. think Ezra's a clone, anyways, but that's mm-hmm. for another. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. Okay. Uh, question numero five, Mr. Miracle. Yes. So uh, we have seen several famous bounty hunters this season. We've seen Fennec Shyam. We've seen Asajj Ventress. And we've seen Cad Bane. My question is, do you expect that we will see any more bounty hunters? And if so, who do you think we might see? Um, Go ahead, Derek. Derek. Yeah. Um, well, what do we have? What, three more episodes, right? Or do we have more? Uh, I was trying to look if it was, or is it 17? I was thinking it was 15. Maybe it's 17. It Uh, is 15. You're right. We have three more. We have Into the Breach, Flash Strike, and then on May 1st, the cavalry has arrived. Okay, so it's going to be one a week? No? Yeah, one a week. Yep, 17, 24th and 1st. We've got 17, 24, and May 1st. So... I imagine these three will be the last arc then. So probably not. I mean, I could see them popping a Saj in just to be woo and, and just confuse people more because, again, we didn't get her story. So maybe that's what they're going to do. Um, and just, again, make no sense tying it into really what's going on with Bad Batch and why they have it. It's just wasted filler. Um, but uh, I... I mean, again, it would make sense if Boba Fett was there, right? If he'd still be a kid, but it would be make sense if he was brought in, right? That they'd want fresh, in so in some degree, fresh clone DNA, right? Um, because he'd be the closest thing to Django um, as a you know non um, diluted DNA test. So, um, 
and maybe maybe he just makes a quick cameo like thanks you know uh like he's dropping off a, a you know his blood you know donation every month for you know 100 quid <laughs> so um, so you know so maybe he's he gets a small <clears throat> payment every time he makes a stop over right um so yeah we could we could probably i'm gonna go with that a young boba fett donating blood that's an interesting theory i also think that we will see another bounty hunter and i think it will be boba but i think in keeping with the boba fett redemption tour that's been happening since the book of boba fett he will show up to help protect his little sister so he is going to join in efforts to save Omega because, and, and, and how does Boba know that his little sister is A, in existence, and B, in danger? Well, Finnick Shand has told him uh, in passing when they hang out at some bounty hunter bar and he has seen on the Bounty Puck Network for the Bounty Hunter Guild all these bounties being offered for a girl that he is all like, wait a minute, that sounds like me, but as a girl. And so he's going to show up to help in the big final fight. Uh, in fact, he, I keep going back to the title of the cavalry has arrived. Maybe Slave One shows up as the cavalry to help out, you know, and that's Boba doing his thing to protect his little sister and whatnot. Um, alternate theory, Boba Fett's not involved, but we do see another bounty hunter and it's Bosk because we have some cool Trendoshan models in the animation style because the Bad Batch has encountered them before uh, in Season 2 back on Kashi. Uh, and Good. one of the uh, the prisoners in this very episode, Juggernaut, was a Trendoshan. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Or it could be, could be Carr could send out a signal to Boba Fett. Yeah, that's true. That, or that's Nala Say. So, or maybe Nala Say, yeah. Yeah. So. All right, uh, Nathan, what is your own answer to your own question? I do think that if we do see a uh, famous bounty hunter, that a young Boba Fett is the most likely, uh, simply because the clones are all based on Jango Fett, and he is the closest thing we have to actual Jango Fett. And it might be a nice way to wrap up kind of the clone story to have it begin with Jango and end with Boba. I don't know exactly what role he would play, but I, I think he may appear. Maybe maybe he's got a giant jar with Django's head in it, just like in Futurama, <laughs> and he actually gives a great roaring speech. They can take our lives, but they can never take our freedom. And yeah, I'm gonna go with probably not, but but I like where your head's at, which is to say, not in a jar. <laughs> so uh, or maybe let's, they want to use put a pin in that idea. Put it in a dark trooper. Maybe that would bring him back to life. Yeah, he's going in. I like where your head's at. But no. <laughs> he's going to lecture them about how bad the uh, final groups of clones were because, you know, when you make a copy of a copy of a copy, it's just terrible. That's so what's going to happen. be voiced by Michael Keaton. Yes, he's going to be all, I like all pizza, publicity. Steve. <laughs> I, like, I like pizza, Steve. All right, anyway, well, if any of those things happen, you can be sure that we're going to discuss them here on the what a piece of junk podcast but one other thing that you could be sure we're going to talk about on episodes of wapage is what star wars shirts are we wearing this week and since we just talked about boba fett i'm gonna go first because i'm wearing my boba fett hawaiian shirt where you can definitely see the fire spray but also it's surfing boba fett and the thing that he's surfing using as his surfboard is of course the frozen han solo from the empire strikes back and return of the jedi i love Very this nice. shirt so much and it is finally warm enough some might say too warm to be wearing a hawaiian shirt even inside on a nice springtime sunday night as we are recording this time 90 yes. degree day Boringish. Anyway, yeah, so yeah, this is just such a great shirt. Uh, probably not officially licensed. I think I got it on Timu or Wish.com or something like that, but I was like, I can't say no! It's Boba Fett surfing on Han Solo with the ship in the background. So, yeah, good times. Uh, Derek, what you got on this week? Uh, so, I don't have a Star Wars shirt on, but I will share something Star Wars in a minute. But um, I wanted to share this shirt that I know Scott will appreciate. So, okay. uh, again, last week, part of the reason I wasn't on uh, was because I was on spring break because Sophia's school was out. So we decided to go to Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge. Um, and if you know what's there now, Scott, that they built last year. Do I? Uh, <laughs> it's Bucky's. 
Ah, Derek has on a Bucky shirt, and on the back is. Let me get close. It's like a. Bucky, oh, it's like a postcard. Tennessee, the volunteer yes. states. Good times. Yeah. Yes. So that is that is uh, very close to where my parents live. Yes. Yeah, I was about so. to say you're you're making me smile with the Bucky's reference, and and Nathan is all happy because you're talking about Tennessee. Yes. So go Vols. Um, I'm, Unfortunately, I, it's like a band shirt. I almost want—I wanted to get the one that said, you know, Gatlinburg, Tennessee on it, or Pigeon Four. I don't know which one it was because they were out of it. Um, so, but I went with the one that was at least the postmark Tennessee, um, generic enough that you know it still will count. Um, but I may have to at some point go back and get another shirt that says, you know, where I'm actually from, uh, the Bucky's where I got it at. But anyways, I figured that. But I do have stuff that uh, I wanted to share. So. Anyways, uh, as our listeners all know, first time people probably don't. Um, So if you're first time, welcome to the show. Uh, Sorry, it was a little short today, but we only had a few things to talk about. But I did get um, my uh, donation uh, prize support from the Star Wars Players Committee for the CCG. So I wanted to share that with you guys. So the first thing I got um, for a couple of things was um, you get the little cool Players Committee poker chip card. Our poker very chips. nice. Yes, so, yep, cool. yep, very nice. Just like that. And then I got a cool um, Hunt Down and Destroy the Jedi virtual promo. Um, oh, that is Okay, cool. I can't quite make out the Hold image. On. What? It's a little too glary. What, I mean, I see yeah, a red it, lightsaber. It's Vader from Rogue One. Oh, he's marching down the hallway. Yes, and then, but got then it. you'll see this one is when he's like Jedi Council, all, you know, CGI'd in. Can you see it that way? Ah uh, yes, 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 because he he is alone in the the t- the, the council chamber. Yeah, yeah. That, that's so. where he uh, declares himself a Jedi Master. Yes, yes, finally. Um, and then part of the donation um, that I did, I got to pick one quote unquote um, hollow sheet where I got to pick nine cards that I wanted um, for uh, them to print out a basically you know a three by three uncut sheet. Um, which you could obviously cut and then you know use them for the actual slip foils, but I went as usual. I went full rebels. So nice. I nice. see all... Ezra and Hera and Chopper and Sabine and Ahsoka. Kanan. Ahsoka with the two white lightsabers. There's yep. Zeb, oh, the ghost, the and I can't so, quite make out the. So final there's Sabine, card, but... Kanan, and Hera, and then you got Ahsoka, Ezra, and Chopper. And then you got the Phantom and Go. Oh, the Phantom. Okay, yep. cool. And, and Zeb. Yeah. Zeb, which, like I mentioned earlier, Steve Bloom. So I did have some correlation for today. And the yeah. other thing you get is they actually, these are pretty sweet. I don't know if they actually have somebody make these or if they use like a 3D printer, but it's it's a cardboard product. But they make uh, customizable uh, deck boxes. And oh, very cool. I got oh, that is nice. The one with hair and on it. So I enjoy that they make larger sized deck yeah. boxes since yeah. nowadays a full deck of Star Wars CCG includes a bajillion more cards. Well, yeah, now it's got the side deck, right, with the defensive shields and stuff, and you can put yeah. all of them in there because, you know, there's so many. Instead of just banning or eradicating cards, they still do that old decipher. And then it was just Magic an updated uh, hyper route navigation chart with all the updated planets. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and where it's all at. So, there you go. So, anyways, so just a, a shout out to them. Obviously, it cost me some money, but it's part of a donation. Oh, I got it. I did get a cup too. Not that it's nice. really good. So, not that we use it. Just contain whatever stuff I have here. So, all use right. To hold. Uh, it, if if Nathan and I had it, we'd use it to hold paint brushes for our models. There you go. What paint brushes? You think I keep paint? But sorry, excuse me. I, I you do, think I, I keep models to paint? Sorry, I do, and I, I worry. I keep paint where you Sorry. keep the brushes. <laughs> it's a working station. Yes. Cool. All right, Nathan, what do you got for a Star Wars shirt or merch? Well, you know, we talked about how we like Rebels a little more than Bad Batch, so I'm wearing a Rebels shirt. It is yeah. Ahsoka riding a lot wolf. Nice. I've worn it before, and I'll wear it again because I love this <laughs> shirt. Nathan, you're such a rebel. Uh, yeah, sure. I'm a rebel daddy, a loner. All right. <laughs> anyway. Okay, well, if you guys out there listening want a cool What a Piece of Junk t-shirt or mouse pad or iPad case or coffee mug, please check out the Fandom Podcast Network store over at tpublic.com. Just 
Head to tpublic.com and search Fandom Podcast Network in the search bar, and you can see all kinds of cool merchandise from our show or any of the other great shows here on the Fandom Podcast Network. And speaking of the FPN, Nathan, let folks know where they can find us out there on the internet, please. You can find us anywhere pods are cast, and that includes... Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Podbean, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Google Play, YouTube. On uh, Podbean, we are at fpnet.podbean.com. That is the master feed. You can find us on Facebook, What a Piece of Junk, a Star Wars podcast. You can email us, whatapieceofjunkpod at gmail.com. On X, Twitter, or X Twitter, whichever one you want it to be, we're at What Wars. Uh, on Instagram, we're at Fandom Podcast Network. And if you do listen to us on any of these uh, the outlets, uh, we would love for you to give us a review. And Derek, why do we want those reviews? So um, as we complained enough about it um, with the recent uh, CGI animation shortcuts that Lucasfilm has been doing with making things darker and dimmer, if you want to keep help us keep the lights on, then we need five-star reviews, please, in these podcasts. Um, again, it helps the new listeners find us like i mentioned earlier if there's any new listeners we appreciate you sticking it through um as we're winding down here for this episode but you know to get our stuff out there uh needs more reviews um and again we'll take whatever reviews you can give us if you want to give us one star and tell us we suck so be it um we do appreciate uh constructive criticism so we know what to work on to make sure it's better um, but we'll take whatever we can get but again five star reviews are preferred to help keep the lights on at the drunken gungan yeah, because you don't want us to be as dark as the Bad Batch has been. It's just not pretty. I mean, it's not super pretty when we're bright, but let's be frank. It'd be worse if we were dark. All right. Well, anyway, thank you very much for joining us on this episode, everybody. Thank you for all of your feedback and your support. And we want to remind you all to please always respect each other and always respect each other's fandom. All right, Nathan, punch it. <laughs> <laughs>